that, that that will not be a problem, certainly for the local election. So we now we understand it will be mixed ballots, and it may be a little confusing, but it's at least you get to vote on the people that actually tax you. So we have to work on that. One of the things that I've worked on continuously, and I now I can't remember who it was from the school board, but we uh, carried some licensure bills. And that's very helpful for, for the statewide. Uh, Lee Ware carried it in the House, and I had it in the Senate. And we were both uh, legislators of the year by the VEA, which is unheard of for Republican <laughs> legislators. So uh, we were very, very proud of that and very proud to help. And, and part of the reason for doing that is it put it in y'all's control. And it's a state licensure, and, and it can be a problem for some folks have a problem taking that test, passing that test. You guys know if they're good teachers or not. You guys know if they respond, if students respond to them. And so that was a big bill that I really thought was great for localities to put the control back in your hands, keep more control in your hands. We talked about taxes. There would have been a big tax increase for citizens because of what the federal legislation was. And Lee Ware will talk more about that. He's on a, dealt with it more on the statewide level. But we're returning a whole lot of taxes to the citizens of Virginia. I, again, it, it brought some uh, voter integrity bills. I've brought them all three years. They've now been vetoed by two different governors. But it's a, a, a bizarre concept that you actually have to show that you're a citizen of Virginia before you vote in Virginia elections. I know it sounds radical, but uh, it did pass both houses, no problems, but vetoed by both governors. And so those are some of the things that I've worked on. I've, I've worked with you guys in the past three sessions on a lot of education bills. Once again, we failed on the zoning bill, <laughs> the proffers. We tried and uh, something was done. I think that's the end of proffers for a little while. We've tried to help straighten it out. I think they've given you direction on what you can and can't do, and, and I think we've given you a kind of a roadmap to what to try to, to solve that issue. And so those were some of the issues that y'all brought up to us, and we tried to carry through one. And we have to answer questions on where we stand, and then we'll talk about hopefully Bill, if we can propose before session starts, and hopefully we'll be there to work on them in 2020. Morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the boards. Uh, it's good to be back with you. I, I really appreciate this early start that you get. You are the first of the four localities that I represent that has convened this kind of thing, and you have done it consistently. It's a real plus for us to have this conversation early in the in the uh, works to 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 sound out what's possible and uh, hear what your interests are. I think Senator Peak has covered a lot of the things. We've done a number of things uh, collaboratively. Some we've been successful on, some not so much. Obviously on proffers, we didn't get everything we asked for, but there was, I think, in part, the pressure that was brought by this board and others uh, was recognized at the state level. And, and so there has been a little bit of the rollback that uh, the home builders, uh, what they had, had put forward several years ago. I think it's, it has recalibrated the balance in an appropriate way to allow localities a little bit more say so. And of course, your own attorney, uh, Tara McGee, was was very a and a very able advocate for you all down there as well uh, when we carry those. Um, one of the big things that we we worked on this year in the legislature had to do with taxation, as as uh, Senator Peake said, um, and we we had to to uh, fine tune what we do in Virginia uh, so that there would didn't end up an inadvertent tax increase for. Uh, Virginians out of the, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that was passed in Washington because of the dramatic increase in uh, the standard deduction. So we doubled our standard deduction and we also uh, are providing this year, which we couldn't get in quickly enough to, to change, uh, providing for a tax, uh, tax relief to uh, citizens. Um, we were also able, uh, with the relatively strong economy, we've seen revenues continue to steadily increase just in the natural growth of, the, of private business because, our, of course, our big uh, revenues are the, the sales tax, but even more so the personal income tax. Both of those have steadily risen, which is a reflection 
of the broader strength of the economy and the fact that our unemployment is the lowest it's been in 49 years. Uh, so th those things are, are all really positive signs. I think one of the important things that we did um, was to provide funding for the state share of a 5% raise for public school teachers. I think that's important. I think it's probably going to be important from what I'm hearing from uh, localities to provide uh, what we can to begin to build back on support positions as well for uh, schools. I know back when we went through the, the Great Recession, uh, we were compelled, and Governor Kane, uh, I, think, I, I think, prudently trimmed back some of our uh, uh, expenditures, and this was one that got trimmed, uh, and we've never been able to get fully back there for support positions, so that'll be important. Um, and speaking of funding, one of the challenges I think we're going to see going forward has to do with uh, uh, casino gambling, of all things. Three of our most uh, needy areas, uh, Bristol, Danville, and uh, Portsmouth, have asked for authority to uh, establish casino gambling. What, what does that matter to Goochum? This is the way it matters. Uh, right now, lottery is funding is one of the largest streams that we provide for public schools, and there's considerable uh, evidence that uh, expanded both online gambling and uh, let alone casino gambling would begin to tap into that uh, resource and thereby reduce state income, which is significant. Last year it was a record year, over $600 million, uh, which was distributed to schools. So that, that I think is going to be a big uh, question for us this time uh, on a lot of levels, but but not least of which is the revenue side uh, for you all. Um, one other thing, I think I've not mentioned this yet, but I've carried a bill several years for you on behalf of the registrars to find the, the kind of funding that we've never, uh, again, have not kept up with. Uh, your your uh, voter office has been uh, persistent, and I think rightly so, in reminding us that that has not been done and needs to be done. It's one of a number of things that you supplement substantially. Anyway, those are those are a few things that I've I both have seen or I've actually started to edge into what, what's coming. So maybe I've gotten ahead of myself. And, and one thing on that and the education funding and point out and also we've increased the number of, of spots for counselors in the school. And, and and that's a very important with the violence and things that we have. So that was a very good thing that came out of the budget to get those positions built back up. So hopefully we can catch those problems in the schools. And then one other, our retirement account, Virginia VRS, is in a very strong position to, to, to the economy. So that's years past a, a huge concern for localities and, and the state that, that we, we're much stronger now in, in, in improving there. And then now Delegate McGuire can. Yes, I'm Delegate John McGuire. I'm the House of Delegates and represent District 56, which is western parts of Henrico County. Uh, <coughs> between Hickory Shore Pump. It's pretty much the eastern half of Houston County. It's all of Louisa County, and it's two precincts in Spotsylvania. A lot of people know that, Red Lake Ave. Uh, I got to tell you, a lot of you guys know I served our country as a Navy SEAL for 10 years, and I see this as a, another way to serve our, our country, our community. And my wife and I took us a while to figure it out, but we now live in Goochum County. <laughs> and, um, I'm just very honored to have this pen. And uh, the speaker, when he, had, he used to announce me, he would say, well, the gentleman from Correct County, uh, you have the floor. Uh, and now he said, the gentleman from Goochum County. So it's been an honor to be here and be part of this. Um, I also want to uh, thank Senator Peek and uh, Senator Delia Ware for a great job. Uh, talk about what we did last session, but I'll give you guys a couple things I've observed. And probably the newer member of uh, the General Assembly. Uh, it's every two years for the House of Delegates. We're all up for re-election November 5th. And uh, I got a lot of news credit for saving in Virginia $100 million uh, just one week into my first session. <coughs> uh, but the truth is, we all know it's all about teamwork. And that idea came from this meeting a couple of years ago. Uh, how many people have heard of the Goosen Driving Theater? So for about eight years, uh, they had tried to get uh, a signage on Interstate 64, and for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And we were able to put uh, stakeholders in a room and treat each other with respect, work as a team, and we got it done. And I say sometimes the best bill 
is no bill at all. So if you were to go to BPAP or something, it might say that John has had eight bills billed, but what it doesn't say is that we were able to put people in a room and find another way. I'd rather have less regulations, not more regulations, if that makes sense. And a wise member of the Board of Supervisors in Houston said, we need to be very sure that we don't have unfunded mandates. <laughs> so, we'll so you know, <laughs> and, and Lee Ware has been a great mentor, by the way. Uh, by the way, he probably wouldn't like the credit I'd give him. But, uh, you know, every vote that I make, I'm a pretty smart guy. But if someone's been there longer than you, or someone's an expert on real estate, I'm probably going to go to the real estate expert if someone's been here long. So um, we've had a lot of success. Uh, what else? Um, Gary Raley with the school board. I'm on, I'm on the education committee, by the way. And some people said, uh, oh, you got education as if it wasn't a great thing. But to me, it's my favorite committee. I have four committees. But education is my favorite. And um, uh, Raley and I have worked closely on um, several things. And I was really proud that uh, while we were getting a tour, one of your teachers came up to me and said, we have this uh, shortfall with capabilities of our school nurses. And so we put some legislation and it ended up helping uh, first responders all over the state of Virginia and all the people that provide medical care to students in all of our schools. And I called that young woman up and said, hey, you remember that idea you gave me a year ago? Uh, well, it's a law now. And she said, you were listening? <laughs> and I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, it's been an honor to serve. Um, last year, we, we scored teacher pay raises. Teachers asked for a 5% pay raise. And, you know, I think, and we all probably agree, we'd like to do a lot better than that. And, but I think the, uh, the talk was to give them a 3% pay raise. But talking with Jeremy Rayleigh and some other school superintendents, they were like, no, 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 it needs to be 5%. So I'm not saying I had anything to do with it. But I certainly went around to every delegate and every senator and said, hey, it needs to be 5%. And luckily, we got 5%. And I know that, um, I know that Speaker Kirk Cox has announced uh, for the next session is that he's going to fight to increase teacher pay raise again, and he's also going to fight to freeze college pay. Now, I personally like the idea of the free market making a decision on things like that, but that is something the speaker said. And a lot of people say, well, well how do you do that? Because I think that if you have $20, you can't spend 40 You have to be fiscally responsible. But I think because of the Trump tax cuts, and the economy, as Lee Ware said, is better than it's been. Unemployment's better than, you said, 49 years. Because of those things, I think the budget, there are more people working, less people unemployed, we're collecting more monies. And so I think the budget in 2009 for Virginia is probably around 90 billion. Last year, maybe 114 billion. So we have a, I guess we have a, uh, we have a surplus right now, no we? Yeah. And so things are going well. So I think that we could possibly see some improvements. I'm not the guy that makes the decision on that, but I'll do my best to help because I'm a big supporter of what you do and uh, our school system. I'm also in counties, cities, and towns, and I work with Senator Mark Peake and Lee Ware and everyone else in the process. Uh, the Bill came out of Disney County, and we also work on the board of the I mean, I voted for it. I think Lee Ware, I voted for it, but it was so good it didn't make it right. <laughs> and um, I've had four bills in just two years where every Democrat and every Republican voted yes, and it went all the way through. And I'd love to tell you that I'm a smart guy, and those are my ideas. But there were, a lot of them came from people in this room, so we really appreciate you joining us early and helping us out. But I think I also had the distinction, if that's what it is, of having a bill for our registrars. It would have uh, added due process to the career field of a registrar so that they couldn't get fired without cause. And it got it passed, and it went all the way to the governor's desk, and it got vetoed. So I have a bill that got vetoed. I guess that's something that, you know, it's just part of, the, part of the process. But we'll just keep working on that. Um, but anyway, there's a lot to talk about. It's an honor to be here. A lot of the ideas come here, and I like to do it early. And uh, thanks for helping us make Virginia better. Thank you. So maybe we should, can we dismiss, uh, Ms. Musk, would you like to say anything? <coughs> Uh, my name is Karen Mask. I'm the district director for Congresswoman Spanberger. Um, I just want to thank you for the invitation to uh, attend today. I look forward to learning more about the priorities of, of uh, the county uh, and to see how we at the federal level can help support the needs of Houston County. So thank you. We thought today was our broadband announcement. It was a good, good opportunity. So. <coughs> I, think, uh, I think it fits right in with what we've been focusing on at the federal level. level so Lisa, would you like to introduce uh, Lisa Driven, our chair of the Future Economic Development Authority. And lunch provider. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Hi, Rob Beck. This is 
district forest supervisor. I just wanted to thank the delegation. Um, this is my last year in office, and uh, it's been a joy to work with, with, with everyone, with, with John, Lee, Mark, over time, our previous delegate, delegates, um, previous representatives, current representatives. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's amazing the teamwork that's displayed by the folks in this room to get things done uh, across the aisle, um, and on and on, partisan cases is very helpful. I've just learned a ton from all of you, and I wanted to thank you for that opportunity, and, and good luck in your elections this year. I don't expect there'll be any problems, but uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing you, see you in the future. I hope you stay in touch. <laughs> okay. Wow, very nice. Thank um, Susan Lasclet, District 1 Supervisor, and I sincerely hope that I'm not following Bob into retirement. John Badesky, I have the pleasure of serving as the county administrator here. Um, one thing I, I, I will come back and I'll, I'll be walking through the agenda with you, but uh, I just want to say thank you. I appreciate the support you give us, but also the access. Um, I've had to work with a number of representatives over the years. You guys are texting us from the floor, and you know, I heard this is a true, um, and, and it is extremely helpful to know you're there when we need you. Uh, we, we don't try to take advantage of that, so when you hear from us, it's usually something important and meaningful. Um, but uh, even when you're not in sessions, I mean, I, there have been opportunities that you're going to speak with a group and want to know what gives them's position or thoughts or perspectives. And so thank you for those calls and, and uh, advocacy. You know, you see, uh, Tara and Paul um, downtown a little more than some of the rest of us. Uh, they, they, they really represent us, but we um, really appreciate uh, you being there when we do. Manuel Alvarez, I've been on the board now for almost eight years. And like Bob, this is my last of these minutes officially. I'll still be out there in the office. <laughs> Maybe I'll get a free lunch, but I'll be here. <laughs> But anyway, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure. I think this meeting, like I said earlier, has been great. And I don't know how many times I've gone down to the General Assembly to help with bills or whatever. I'm still available. And I'll be available afterwards <laughs> if needed. I'm, I'm not, not leaving Gushla by any means. I'll just let someone else, hopefully in the audience, uh, now take my spot next year. Um, and I do want to thank you all for your access. I mean, I've got... Um, even uh, Congresswoman Spenberger's office working on mailbox issues and uh, uh, other simple issues that people don't realize <coughs> what it takes, but it, it takes all of us working together to make it, make it happen. And the school board has been great. When I was campaigning eight years ago, I would knock on the door. We had, a, we had this issue, this little issue of $300,000 that had been sent to Ethiopia and um, <laughs> utility checks that have never been cashed. And people would like, come up to the door and people would say, what are you going to do about the schools? <laughs> um, and the greatest thing was the, the partnership with Kevin and with the school board that, that really made the schools so much better than they were. And um, so it's been a great, great eight years. And, <coughs> and I hope we still have a um, great three months ahead and many, many more good years. <coughs> My name is Ken Peterson, uh, Board of Supervisors, District 5. And uh, Manny and Bob have been paroled for good behavior. And maybe at some point my performance would justify a similar parole. But uh, I'm unopposed on, on, on the board, so, uh, or on the, uh, uh, the election this year. So I will get an opportunity to thank you more often going into the future. So this will be your best thing to uh, It is an honor and pleasure to serve in Gutsa. Gutsa is a very special place. The folks that have been here for a while know that. Um, there's two types of people in Gupsa, those who've been here forever and those who got here as soon as they could. Um, <clears throat> it, it is just a very special place. We can have a discussion like this room with a lot of competing ideas. It's called the marketplace of ideas and even disagree sometimes but not become disagreeable and come together unite. And together we've been able to accomplish things that people thought were impossible and it's almost become routine. And that, for that reason, it's been an honor and a pleasure to serve and I look forward to continuing to serve. So thank you very much. Good afternoon, John Lumpkins, District 3 Supervisor. I'm, 
and we're still <coughs> unopposed of uh, this upcoming election. So I, I look forward to another four years. Uh, and I, I can't really add to what's been said. I, I would just echo, I spent six and a half years on the school board before uh, this group uh, appointed me. And then I had a special election last year, and you know, this will be for a four year term coming up. But I, I had the same experience that you're all describing from the school board's perspective. The help that we've had from our legislators has just been incredible. It, it was really exciting to see things get done on the school side, and it's been exciting to see that on this side. And, you know, we can't take it for granted that it's, it's not everywhere that has the level of cooperation and working together that we have. We, we see it at every Board of Supervisors meeting just, just this last week. Uh, we go until one in the morning, but when we take a break, um, you know, we've heard from 10 people opposed to something, 10 people in favor of something, but we take a break after an hour or two of that, and, and then you see the people get together and they're talking. And, and it's, it, it's a special place, and it's an honor to have a small role here serving the community. Thank you. Tara McGee, County Attorney. I'm Karen Horn, I'm School Board Member District 3, and I also am running unopposed uh, with this election, so I look forward to continuing to work with everyone in this room. And like uh, I heard bits and pieces of the way I feel about this group is it's the relationships and the respect that everyone shows and all they do. I've never, I've never been embarrassed by any of our state um, and elected officials and, and that's probably not easy for many people to be able to say in this day and time. So always um, he represents us so well and so respectfully so I really appreciate that. Um, and, I, and I can talk to you guys. <coughs> so it, it's really uh, that's amazing. Um, so thank you so much for all that and I look forward to uh, <coughs> Jeremy Raley, Superintendent, and I want to thank all of you for the time that you dedicate uh, to support the work that we do here in Goochland. I have had experiences in the past when I visit our delegation and folks are checking their watch like, okay, when's my next appointment? But all three of you give us time and you are open to our, idea, our, our ideas. You have carried legislation that has made our school division better, so we're grateful for all your support. John Wright, I'm with the uh, school board representing District 5. Uh, you guys have done such a great job that uh, our representative from District 4, Beth Hardy, cannot be here with us today because she's meeting with the DOE to work through the details of legislation that you all were very instrumental in carrying and, and passing. So uh, once again, great relationship, treasure it greatly, look forward to another four years of it. Thank you. Are you going to take us through the, through the issues now, or? I can go ahead and do that, if you like. So, um, <clears throat> looking at our agenda here, we have uh, broadband expansion. You want to introduce yourself first? <laughs> Paul Drumwright, Administrative Services Manager uh, out of the County Administrator's Office. And we have a lot of other people in the audience that will be called up as we, um, as we, um, need them as, as we discuss this item. Um, I probably should go ahead and introduce the folks before you start, Paul. Uh, we have Ms. Neil Agnew, our, our clerk of the courts, uh, Jennifer Brown, our um, <laughs> <laughs> commissioner of revenue, uh, Pat Ben Duncan, our treasurer, Jonathan Lyle, our director of um, Monica Solar Water, Ronnie Knuckles, also director of Monica Solar Water. Um, we have our registrar. Um, yep. Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> I know Brian. Ryan. Ryan. Yeah. And then uh, we have um, um, <laughs> Keith Ferguson. Keith, Keith, Keith Burgess behind him. Robin Lynn. Um, also, anybody else in the audience that I miss? I'll uh, say their name. George. George. Oh, George, I think um, Mark introduced George, but anyway, sorry about that. It's a senior moment's come, that's why I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, Paul, sorry. All right. Um, looking to the agenda that is in the back of the room as well as at most of your places, um, for the county side, we have three main issues right now 
uh, that we would like to discuss today. The first one is broadband expansion. This is an item that has been on the legislative agenda for the past couple of years. And uh, if you were with us this morning, you were able to hear more of our exciting announcement about uh, broadband expansion and the efforts that the county is now going to be starting to take. Um, those efforts include continuing to uh, tap into and pursuing the state funds through the Virginia Telecommunication uh, uh, Initiative. And so one of the items that we would ask is continue to support that with additional funds and uh, allowing the Department of Home, uh, Housing and Community Development to continue to operate as they have been and keeping the rules on that um, as little as possible. So it allows uh, localities we, uh, to be able to take advantage of that. We've yet to be able to take advantage of that, but we hope to in the coming year actually be tapping into that and be have some good applications. Let me, let me just add where Paul's coming from. Certainly the fund has been an extreme benefit to localities and, and in particular there's been some holdups. Some of it was the requirements from either having a designated claim as partner, um, either or has been a challenge for us. Uh, we announced earlier that we're committed to both of those uh, partnerships. Sometimes it's hard for these companies to get uh, to make commitments to localities to be a partner. If we had, if we were able to apply as a locality and then issue the funds, would give us a little more flexibility. Some of these uh, folks are not applying for a number of reasons. For instance, if you have applied for a USDA grant, you're not allowed to double dip and receive state funds and vice versa, which there's logic to that. But it also limits our providers. So some providers have already applied for one grant, now they won't partner with the locality to apply for the second grant. If we had some flexibility, in the partnership side of that uh, and give us a little more leverage locally. Um, from a funding standpoint, I do want to say, just in the past few years, the program itself has grown tremendously. There's now $19 million. It was in the single digits at one point, but at $19 million, it's still a drop in the bucket for the state. Uh, they announced at the, the broadband conference we went to last Thursday that just this round of body grants, uh, the state funds, there were, there's $19 million available. They received over $36 million in requests. Um, and so that's just with those that were eligible to, to submit this year. I can only see that growing as more counties like us become more sophisticated in this game, position ourselves better to receive funds for our residents. Uh, that fund is going to need to grow. I know there's a lot of challenges for funds, um, but as you can support that particular initiative, it would be, it would be uh, great for Goodson to be able to be a, a competitor in the next round of funds. Yeah. I can add to that. I think that's the critical one. I think allowing the locality to obtain the grants um, would make it so much easier on us because the, the problem today, if we lock in with a partner and the partner fails, um, we've lost a lot of time and, and probably money. And I think that's happening in some localities where they partner with the vendor, with the providers that could not deliver. And now they're, they're kind of, kind of stuck. It would much, be much better if we could apply for the grant that would allow us to then um, bring in the services necessary. Um, and you heard some comments today from a citizen who is not happy about the time it's taken. Um, and that citizen, you know, I pointed him to the, to the uh, Printed a committee seven years ago when we had just started. And the problem for us is we, we have a lot of things to do first in order to be able to allocate the funding we're allocating today, and maybe we'll be able to allocate even more in the future. We have to first stabilize our financial situation. And so it's taken some time. In the meantime, we, we have to work with existing providers. We, we as a locality cannot provide the service ourselves. That's also part of current code that could change. I'm not sure if it would make sense anyway for us to provide it, but I think we have more more ability to, to pick those providers, and we could do that if we had the money up front. Uh, it, would, it would make life a lot better, a lot easier for us on broadband. It's definitely a need. It has not, uh, since I've been on the board, it hasn't gotten better or less needy, needful, needy. <laughs> 
uh, it's been, um, it's gotten worse because people need more. Uh, it's become a part of life. You need it for medical care, you need it for business, and um, whatever we can do, whatever you all can do to provide more funding and make it easier for us to apply, I would be great. You know, I think you point up one of the challenges, and that is what is, we operate in a free market. Private right. market is the dominant uh, economic paradigm. To what extent do we want to publicly fund this private enterprise? And I think that's a, that's a challenge for all of us, whether it's at local level or at the state level. We have, as, you, as was mentioned, dramatically increased state funding for that. It went from low single digits to near 20 million this year. Um, I would be surprised to see us not continue to increase um, subject to what would be available as with all the other calls upon state funding. And I think the other thing we have to continually keep in mind is that the, it is, the provision comes primarily through private providers, many of whom were here today. It was an impressive array of folks you, you had here. And I think one of the things that we can do, and we've done, is diminish the regulatory hurdles. Not every locality in Virginia is as welcoming as, as Guchin has been. And one of the things that my colleagues and I did uh, recently was limit the amount of time that can transpire between a permit's application and it's, it going forward. In other words, if it's not done, uh, and I think it's 90 days, but I could be, uh, may not have the timing right. Yeah. We, we've narrowed that, that, and we've also limited what localities can charge to put in the basic infrastructure, the towers, the base stations, and so on. Um, there were places where, in other parts of the Commonwealth, people were charging exorbitant fees to put in uh, the basic uh, structure. You all have been welcoming, but we've, we've done that as a way to encourage the folks who have a huge cost, capital cost, to come to Virginia because we have a uh, more generally welcoming place. And I, I th I'm confident we will continue to work on that as we can. Thank you, Lee. I know that was one of the bills that we worked on was the tower bill where phone company wanted to be able to put towers anywhere with pretty much no uh, local involvement. And we were able to come to a bill that was, that was very good. And I think in the meantime, we actually reduced our cost. Our costs were kind of normal for towers. They were a little higher for towers than for other conditional uses. But we've now lowered them um, to the same level as any other use so that we can encourage folks to come and, and build towers. And it's, it's starting to happen a little more. Uh, but uh, the, in fact, the bill actually copied some of our language, which was that you could build a tower. Uh, I think ours is 70, 70 feet or shorter by right. And I think the bill said 90 feet or shorter by right. And I, I thought that was a good, good compromise. Any other comments on broad payment? Or? Um, along those lines, as we look at tools in the toolbox for localities, uh, certainly service districts, it, it was added that you could create a broadband service district. Um, while it may or may not be practical for us to do that, I think having those tools in our toolbox to explore, um, so as you get kind of, and I think Mr. Alvarez mentioned one that might have had a negative impact on localities, as those come across the desks and we monitor the bills as well, we'll, we'll look forward to giving you some feedback on that. Um, but I, I think the more local flexibility we have certainly allows us to, to be more dynamic on making some decisions when it makes sense. We won't always take advantage of some of the particular bills, um, but it, it does give us some flexibility. It certainly allows us to, to be more nimble when we're trying to respond to these. One more thing, if I don't mind, I, 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 um, this has been kind of my passion for probably 15 years. The, you heard CBDC now is providing broadband because they, they actually have to run fiber to man manage their infrastructure and they decided to go ahead and run fiber, but they actually have to create a subsidiary of the company in order to provide it because power companies are not allowed to provide broadband. Dominion, we didn't talk about it today, but Dominion has announced that they're going to be willing to provide middle mile um, fiber so that others can hook up to that fiber. Um, and their, their excuse was, well, we're not allowed to provide broadband, so we're just going to stay with the middle mile. If, if the mini problem doesn't want to get into the broadband um, service, but it would be, uh, it would be, if they did what 
what CDs <coughs> are doing, Kushman could be covered in a couple of years. And that, they're not willing to do that at this point. They're just playing on the tower and say, you take it from our telephone pole, from our pole down into the houses. And so then we have to find a partner to do that. Um, I'm not sure that they would do it if they could do it themselves. But I think even in their report, it kind of said, yes, we're the most able to do this, but um, make us. <laughs> was kind of their, their report. So anything that we could do around that, make it easier for companies like, like Dominion to, to provide the fiber to the home would be, would be great. Um, last year, there were a couple bills. I'm not sure where they all landed having to do with uh, easements and access to right away for utilities and internet. So I think we're gonna see more of that coming up this year from what I'm hearing from some providers. So we'd like to stay close with you guys on, on those issues as they come up. I think uh, Kathy Byron uh, had a legislation this year for a broadband position. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? She said. Several big, yeah, yeah bills. I, I, I want to say broadband is our, but it's like a broadband yeah. person yeah. who would be a, a coordinated efforts around the whole Commonwealth so they don't duplicate after a waste of money. Yeah. You get, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I know, I, I know I've got it in my notes. I couldn't find it on my phone, but I've got those notes somewhere. But we're doing some things in the general summit that should make uh, us save money and uh, be more efficient. That's what we're trying to do. Trying to ease regulations, let everybody cooperate, and, and I will commend the board. You are very proactive in, in the administration. You let us know. You let us know well ahead of time that something's coming up, that you have a problem with it, or that you like it, or what you want to come up with. And it, it, it's too late to call us after we voted. So <laughs> it's, it's very nice. Y'all do a very good job of, of keeping us posted of how something's going to affect you. And we appreciate that because y'all know what the pace is. And so we really appreciate y'all letting us know where you stand on these things. Moving on to the second item we have on the list um, related to the Virginia Cooperative Extension uh, restoring funding for county staff positions. This relates to an issue that the county has had with uh, Cooperative Extension here in the county where we um, where a, uh, had to go without a staff position for uh, almost over a year because there was a lack of uh, funding through a typical funding model of federal, state, and local funds to fund that position. So that was actually suffering in um, our efforts related to agriculture. And so that is one item that had been brought to our attention. I know, I uh, believe uh, Virginia Cooperative Extension will be also speaking with y'all about that and the farm bureaus yeah. do as well we're aware we're, we're well aware of it uh i think all of us have a fair number of rural counties and it's uh we've lost a number of agents so it's just taking the time to get the funding back one of our goals is keep cushion of rural and it makes it easier when we have somebody that can, that can help us and guide us. Like Monica Solomon wanted us a lot working with uh, the extension office, but if we, we have them in this building now. If you'd like to visit them before you leave, they're right here in this building. We've got the action center here now. And um, anyway, so anything we can do to keep them stopped, it would be great. All right. The final issue, uh, from the county side, reimbursement for the compensation and expense of the electoral board and the general registrar. I know that was referenced earlier and actually would invite uh, Mr. Lynn to come on up and speak to that issue. This is an issue that was on the legislative agenda in previous years. And, uh, yeah. Let him take it. Mr. Chairman, members of the boards, Mr. distinguished members of the General Assembly. Uh, I'm taken by uh, Mr. Peterson's remark about the people who have been here forever <laughs> and those who got here as soon as they could. Unlike Bonnie Knuckles to my rear, I'm not one of those people who've been here forever, but I did serve on the school board with his brother 35 years ago. 
when we managed to get a increase in teacher salary of 10% for four years in a row at the, in at the institution of Governor Roth, as Mr. Ware will remember. Because at that time, our counties had no money, and so the state put the money in. But we got to 10% every year. And if you can imagine, that was quite an impact when we had a starting, starting salary of only $12,000 a year. So, <clears throat> but I want to start by saying, particularly um, before I go on to the compensation request, to again publicly state the great appreciation and thanks of the electoral board to the county attorney for getting the court order that brought our voter registrations home. Just in case anybody did not know, the uh, deputy uh, registrar at this very moment <laughs> is sending out all the notices. Just, <laughs> <laughs> just completed. <laughs> good, good timing there, Ryan. Okay. We have asked for the 100% reimbursement to localities for, I think, maybe a decade. And it may not seem like a whole lot, but the code does say that the um, counties, the localities shall be reimbursed in 24.2111 uh, annually as authorized in the Act for the salaries of the general registrar. And for electoral board members, reimbursed annually as authorized by the Act. But what they don't say is the Act can say all the foregoing notwithstanding, we shall not compensate you at 100%. And it has been reduced year after year. This year, with Delegate Ware's assistance, he introduced a budget amendment um, for $2,299,705 that would have restored the reimbursement to localities to 100% probably to his disadvantage that I stood beside him at that committee meeting and it was uh, ignored. But I'm hoping that he will bring it back again this year because in my opinion it is a matter of um, keeping faith with the localities. If the code says you shall be reimbursed, then you should be reimbursed. And the state is now in arrears since they first started to reduce the reimbursement by about $30 million. And that's a state that proclaimed in 2017 fiscal year that they had $132 million surplus. And in FY 2018, a $551 million surplus. And FY 2019, $779 million surplus. That surplus came from stealing from us, in my opinion. And we hope that the General Assembly will see in their wisdom the benefits of restoring this very small amount to localities to say we do support the code, we do support the localities, we do support the operation of the departments of election in all 133 jurisdictions. And we hope that Delegate Ware will bring that back again this year. We'll have the support of Delegate McGuire and in the Senate from Senator Pete. Thank you. You're glad to do that. I, I, elections are a fundamental enterprise of a Democratic Republic, so it's it to me it just makes sense that they they need to be funded. The people who who, uh, trim, who administer those elections are indispensable to making it happen, and it hasn't gotten any easier. <laughs> so, in any questions for Ms. Lynn or any other? If not, we'll move on to the school board. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, before we leave the county portion, this is not the registrar, but um, <clears throat> before we leave the county side, uh, there's something that's not on our list this year and has been on our list in previous years, which is fiscally responsible behavior at the state level. 
go back a couple of years ago, the state got put on uh, credit watch for possible downgrade because of fiscally irresponsible behavior. Uh, I'm pleased to see that that rating has now been reaffirmed and, and the AAA has been restored, in part because of the surplus, some of the surplus that you just mentioned. I'm also pleased to see that I guess we're the best place to do business in the country again, so congratulations on that. So the, the restoration of fiscal response at the state level has been good to see, um, in part because this county works very hard uh, and is very fiscally responsible and has been able to achieve a AAA credit rating from both Moody's and S&P. And the smallest county to do that in the nation is triple our size. No other county with less than 75,000 population has been able to achieve that. We worked very, very hard to get that. Now, why it's important that the state do that is because when we look at economic development to bring jobs and opportunities to Gooseland, one of their first screens is which state we want to go to before we go to which county. And if the state doesn't provide that good solid AAA umbrella, then they have to go to another state. Once they, you, you've provided us with that kind of backdrop, then we can compete and say, look, we're, Gooseland County is an attractive place. We are rated AAA by both agencies and we should go ahead. So I just wanted to mention that it's not on here in part because of the progress that's been made, uh, the surpluses that have been generated from the continued economic development. But of course, one of the cautionary tales is we're probably in the latter stages of this economic development uh, expansion cycle. Uh, I think we're probably 12 years into a 10 year cycle. So we're in the latter stages, we're not in the beginning stages, don't know when it's gonna turn, um, but eventually it will. So I just wanted to highlight really quickly just a couple of things just to be aware of during this session uh, fiscally responsible area, if you will. We've talked about a 5% teacher rate as well. We're familiar with the composite index. There's only five counties that have a 0.8 composite index. We are one of them, which means for a 5% teacher raise that's announced at the state level, uh, goods will pay 4% of that five. So we'll pay 80%. So our local share is the, the vast majority. The, the average state line is only 45%. So the average county is going to pay two to two and a half of that five, but we're going to pay the vast majority of that five. So it will disproportionately affect us when those teacher raises are announced. <clears throat> so just want to be sensitive to that to say, okay, uh, what's it going to, how's it going to impact Goodson? One of the other ones, uh, and, and I think Doug, you're probably aware of this one, is that uh, uh, the corporate tax acceleration, where you're pulling tax revenues ahead from subsequent years. And I think that's been adjusted over the years to, from time to time. Is it time to get rid of that and eliminate that, or do you see any wiggle room to use some of that surplus and stop pulling ahead future revenues? Or I know that was on the conversation this year as, as to whether we would um, not do the accelerated sales tax <coughs> reimbursement, and it's mostly big box retailers that are currently hit by that as opposed to mom and pop retailers. Uh, the threshold was about $4 million in revenue. Um, I, there was some conversation to, to continue to reduce that. We've moved that way, and I don't off the top of my head remember if we uh, – if and, and to what extent we advance that this year. Yeah, there have been some of them, I think it moved from four to 10, but eventually the point you had thing, if not now, when, right? When we have a surplus here in the later stages of the economic development, maybe stop borrowing ahead from future years, might be something that we would just suggest or at least try to highlight. So I, and I've printed out copies of where that is if you need some of the legislative need copies of that. The other things, uh, real quickly, um, the, the gas tax, as we all know, was put in place years ago. Uh, it was modified to be a floating rate at 5.1%, so that as gas prices went up, you collect more revenues to pay for more roads. Um, but there was a minimum of 17 and a half cents, and as more electric cars are hitting the roads, there's less and less gas being consumed, and the price of gasoline has been drifting lower. Um, that 5.1% now, because it's a minimum of 17 and a half, that, that's up to over 8% now, about eight, or toward 8.5%. And as if more electric cars hit the road, that gas uh, price of the pump goes down, um, that 8% will continue to escalate and be a higher, higher percentage of what people pay for a gallon of gas. Now, the flip side of that is if there's more electric cars and less volume of gas being used, you may need to look for ways to replace that revenue. Um, I know there's been proposals to, to increase the tax on electric cars since they don't pay a gas tax. Uh, penalizing folks for being green is maybe something that's not politically acceptable either. So I just let you know that there's uh, an issue there that you need to spend some time on, I think, going forward. Um, the last one I'll point to real quickly is um, the notion of a regional government. And we know there's a federal, state, and local, but uh, there are no directly elected regional uh, representatives. 
But it gets back to the tax uh, as well, because we know in Northern Virginia and Hampton Roads, there are regional authorities that collect a transportation tax and have created transportation authorities that are, again, not directly elected, but they have the ability to collect tax and issue bonds. And if you're a bonding authority, a tax collecting authority, it's a lot like a regional government. There's a provision in the code that, to create one of those in the Richmond area, which would basically implement another layer of taxes in the Richmond area, and again, maybe serve to retard economic development by layering in another layer of taxes. There's a threshold in the, in the state code that says uh, that won't be triggered until there's two or three things are hit, one of which is a population of 1.5 million. Simply changing that one number could trigger the implementation of this regional authority and collecting those taxes. And we would just caution against additional layers of government, additional taxes, things that would suppress economic <coughs> development and make it more costly to do business in the, in the Richmond area. And again, we've got copies of that legislation as well if we need to. But uh, that, that triggering authority, that mechanism, just we'd ask you to focus on that to make sure that there's no adjustments there and we don't implement something that would uh, cost the county and the region some, some economic development. Mr. Chairman, that I'll, I'll yield back. Uh, those were the comments I had to make. Again, congratulations on the progress we made, and uh, there's always some, some more to be done. Thank you. Um, school board, have a few topics you want to discuss? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, delegates and Senator, thanks so much for all of the help with the, the agendas that we've had. There's frankly nothing new on this year's agenda, rather just a point of emphasis uh, on a couple of things here, and I, I hope I can be very brief in doing so. First of which is there is a formula for funding the regional governor schools within the state. They are all, it is all set up assuming that everybody is a part-time school. There are three schools that are full-time schools, uh, Maggie Walker uh, Governor School, the Appomattox Governor School, and then Thomas Jefferson in Northern Virginia. The three of those have burdens that the other part-times don't because they have building management, they've got principals, they've got counselors, they've got things that in the current funding model are not covered in any way. And so uh, all I ask is that we have uh, a delineation between full and part-time uh, governor school funding, uh, and I think recognition of the fact that there is a need for building management and the support services that go with a full-time program would go a long way towards helping uh, the region and uh, quite frankly Goosen County too. So I, that's one thing I'd like to just emphasize once again that, that we have there. The other is we want to support any legislation that moves the state closer to fully funding the standards of quality. I know Delegate Warrior mentioned earlier uh, that the Kane administration uh, came through and made an adjustment. Uh, that adjustment has never been corrected. And so we would ask in, in uh, consideration of that that you would uh, support anything that brings us closer to the standards of quality as it was written initially. Um, and then we want to oppose any legislation that requires redistribution of local dollars when establishing virtual schools and programs. There's a lot of stuff that goes back and forth, it seems like, year to year, whether there is a, a virtual Virginia, that sort of thing, where there's a programs that uh, are statewide virtual programs, and we want to be able to keep our dollars here, let the state deal with, with their, their own uh, uh, issues and we just don't want our dollars to be re redistributed to, for those purposes. Um, the next one is that uh, there is uh, some movement in past years for uh, bills that create a parental choice education savings account. We oppose that. We believe actually that that is an unconstitutional uh, proposal and uh, I'll just leave it at that. Um, we oppose any bill that would allow the Board of Education to establish a regional charter uh, of school for school divisions that would be governed by a separate board and not the local board. So if somebody's going to put a school charter or otherwise, we feel very strongly that Goosland County should have a say in how that school is run, plain and simple. Um, 
and then last is to, uh, and this is a, a very minor point, but I think it's something that affects many students throughout the state. I would assume uh, it affects some Goochland students as well, but um, the fact is is that all of the school divisions in the state do not do a reporting to colleges of both a letter grade, uh, a grade point average, if you will, and then what the numerical value that got you to that is. There's been many, many school divisions recently, and Goochland is one of them, that has gone to a 10 point grading scale. That's fine. It makes sense on many levels. Part of the, our motivation in doing that was to keep up with the Joneses who had done the same thing. And the reason that we had to do that is because nobody at the college level is paying attention very closely to which divisions are on 10 point scales, which are on seven point scales, which are on no scales, you know, however it's done. I don't, I don't honestly think there are no scales, but the, the, the truth is, is that if there was a numerical value, then you could truly judge a student's mastery of a subject, particular subject matter. And if you know, Goochland does report a numerical value, but all school divisions do not. And so some child may be more or less qualified and get a position simply because of the difference in the grading scale. And, and we could do away with the needless uh, legislation around creating grading scales if we just said, hey, not only put a grade point average out there, but put the numerical value behind each one of those individual grades. Has anyone drafted legislation for that? I don't believe so. That's it for us. Uh, Dr. Ray, is there anything else that we? No, it was, it was a perfect summary of the school board's pre uh, legislative agenda. Uh, I would say, wrapped around numbers one and two, is this notion that education is changing in 2019 and beyond. And the standards of quality established initially in 1974 were to create a baseline and a common application of funding across the Commonwealth, but knowing that the needs that we have in 2019 are much different than, than 1974. And I attended a webinar this past week about some recommendations that may come from the state superintendent <coughs> through the Board of Ed that ultimately would have fiscal implications. And it's a recognition much like the General Assembly has done in the past, that there's a need for more school counselors than there has been in the past. There's a need to recognize uh, that educating an English language learner costs more than someone with, uh, who does not have that challenge in their educational experience. So I would forecast in the future some recommendations related to the standards of quality that are going to reflect what education is now and will be in the future. And certainly there are going to be fiscal implications to that. It cannot all be done in one time. I heard a price tag that just blew my mind. So certainly we can't do that in this economic environment, but just an openness and a recognition that revisions to the standards of quality need to be made and uh, that you could probably expect some of those things to cross your desk in the future. I guess I think it's timely. We, and I think you point out two of the cost costliest elements of that s students who need additional instruction because English is not their language um, as well as the school safety element and and emotional needs of, of, of counselors I would note that uh, we will be doing again re-benchmarking of the SOQs this year which we do every two years and, and it's an attempt to, to keep up even though we haven't altered the, the formula of the standards of quality we have attempted to ratchet things along uh, which does have a significant, significant fiscal. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, delegates and Senator, again, thank you so much for the support that you've given us over the years. In fact, uh, we, we had to sit and think and search and make sure that all of these, you guys hadn't gotten passed somewhere in the past because you've been so effective for us. So uh, once again, want to thank you for, for all of your efforts. So at this time, if you guys have any um, idea of what's coming uh, in the next session, any hot issues or anything that we can help you with, uh, if you could um, take a few moments to kind of go, go over and what you hear for the first time. Well, I guess I will start and 
First of all, it's, com it's completely unknown what we're going to be doing, who's going to be in control. I'll tell you, this past session where we had the, the tax issue, you know, you've got a divided government, and it had the governor not been in full-scale uh, scandal mode with the lieutenant governor in scandal mode and the attorney general in scandal mode, I doubt we would have gotten the, the tax part of that budget done like we did. We could have been an extended session so we were able to get that worked out. Come 2020, all the House delegates, all the, the state senate are up, so we have no idea who's going to be in control. And of course, it is the two-year big budget session. So for us to predict it, it is really impossible because we do not know who is going to be in charge. I would say revenue is up, and, and Delegate Ware talked about that, and he's on appropriation. They, 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 they are on top of that. Revenue is up now. And revenue was up in 2018 as well. And, and I just remember when we were talking about that 2018 budget, which I did not vote for. We had a big surplus. We had the Medicaid expansion they were counting in. We had the hospital tax that they were counting in. We had, it was and it, something like a billion and a half dollars if, as I added it up, and that they were spending it all, every, every penny of it. And then we went back in 2019 to, uh, to adjust, and we had all the new <laughs> federal tax and, and tax revenue sales and personal income tax were up as well, and we were going to spend all of that. And we have no idea what the Medicaid is going to ultimately cost, and so that's a, a big concern that I've had. Health care cost, whether, who's, no matter who's covering it, whether your insurance is private, federal, statewide Medicaid, the cost is going up and it's uncontrolled. We've had bills to try and con provide health insurance, catastrophic plans, short-term plans that were all vetoed by the governor. So we've been trying to rein in health care costs. I still feel going forward that is going to be one of the biggest problems we're going to face is increasing health care costs and our portion of it is going to increase. And, and uh, Ken said and then Melga Ware, we're way past the time for a correction. And I think everybody knows that. We've been very fortunate. This, the run-up that we've had, we have put some money aside in the rainy day fund and build up some reserves. But to think that 2020, 2021, that, that something we're not gonna have a downturn uh, is, is not realistic, I don't think. And so when we come up with this budget, no matter who's in, it's gonna be split. We don't have a Democratic governor. We don't know what the, House and Senate are going to do, but it's going to have to be realistic. And because if we pass a budget based on what we've been getting now, without any cons consideration for the downturn that may happen, we're going to have overpromising, just like they had to do. You're going to be cutting schools again. You're going to cut positions and cutting, and so that and cutting people off the insurance rolls, Medicaid things like that. So I'm very cautious. And, I, and that's what's going to be the hot button issue will be the budget, and we don't know until after the elections in 2020. Not to mention, of course, the guns, which we'll be addressing uh, in special session in 2018, I mean, November 18th. And then that will continue into uh, the full session. I, I actually started to edge sort of into this in, in my earlier remarks, and I think Senator Peek is right on the money. That it, the Secretary of Finance has already indicated to us that uh, both rebenchmarking and Medicaid costs are going to be substantial, uh, and that those are, I won't say uncontrolled, but they're a significant uh, drop budget driver. Uh, we we have generally taken those in, so I would anticipate both of those being a big uh, chunk in terms of our financial setting. I mentioned the uh, uh, casinos and and the and the lottery revenues uh, concern about that going forward um, as, as far as things specifically related to what you uh, have asked about or that are related to counties I, I would expect to see continual conversation about proffers I don't think we're, people are satisfied ultimately and I'll be interested uh, over time to see what you see with the with the amendments that we did make this year as opposed to the ones that we hoped to make um, I would say I just parenthetically we we, we 
I would want people to be clear, we've maintained a AAA bond rating. It was not restored. It's been sustained all the way through. We did get uh, a note from one of the three rating agencies to, to be cautious, and, and we have been. Uh, so we want, I would not want to leave that uh, uh, uncertainty in the air. Uh, and I think we will continue to do that. Uh, obviously, we'll be looking for specific issues. I have not heard uh, other VACO-related issues, uh, but as you see them, and no doubt you will, uh, I'd certainly be interested in this. Here. What, which hadn't happened in Goochland as much by others. The uh, solar is a big deal in, in a lot of our more rural counties, and so I don't know if y'all are paying, if have gotten a lot of that. Uh, well, okay. And, and so that's, that's I think, a big one for VACO. And uh, we'll see how that plays. You know, they tie up a lot of your rural farmland for 20, 30 years, and the revenue that you guys get is not that substantial. So I think they're trying to take a look at that and make sure it works for the county as well. So that's one that. I think, I think uh, so Mark, we are right. Uh, I think mean, you said it was a. Uh, 12 years into a 10 year cycle, so we know something's going to happen. So we all have these things we want, other people want. But if you had $20, you can't spend 40 more, so we've got to be very cautious. Yes, I saw a slide from my friend. But uh, yeah, so we've got to be very fiscally responsible. Um, what else? I guess we are still in special session, like Senator Pete said. So we're going to be dealing with that in November. But you know, this year, with the Republican majority in the House, in the Senate, we stopped over a billion dollars in tax increases, and I've heard a number of five or six billion dollars in tax increases. Policy. So we don't know what's going to happen in November, but I think it's important that we uh, get things done and try to stay fiscally responsible. Yeah, Jeff, I just follow on those discussions. Um, roll back to the clock to 2007, before the last downturn, uh, BRS was fully funded. And the revenue stabilization fund, the RSF, was fully funded. Um, as we sit here today, the uh, BRS is about 80% funded, plus or minus about 20 billion shortfall, plus or minus. And with a 10 year treasury of one and a half, their hurdle rate is 7%. So I don't know how you generate that going forward with one and a half percent. We're saying we're allowed to be for position. But you should see the other guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are folks out there with 30% funded, yeah. so 80% is not the worst. Yeah, maybe to clean the shirt for the dirty money line. Yeah. But we're worse off than we were in 07, is my only point. So if we're going to get back to where we were before the next down period, that's all. We have the fourth lowest rate for our retirement system of any of the states. We're at 7%, unlike many of our sister states that are 7 and, and beyond, seven and a half and beyond. We've, we've ratcheted it yes. back at a significant cost. Localities have picked up some of the tab. We've picked up some of the tab. Uh, we've worked hard to sustain the v VS, the VRS. Uh, we are in the top quarter of our peers, according to Pew, which does serious uh, research and review on this. So I'd say, although it's may not, it, it's not all that we would hope for. And certainly, the Great Recession and its uh, after effects have have been a challenge to us. We've continued to work hard to sustain it in a responsible method. We will continue to do it. <laughs> uh, I, I have the information here, the extension office is down the street, and uh, I, 
I do want to say thank you to the members of the General Assembly who have always provided us. Mr. Goodwin is particularly a valuable asset, being a farmer himself, uh, as to what the needs are for the soil and water conservation districts. Uh, we uh, do provide an environment that people want to live in, uh, and, and so uh, thank you. We have more funding for cost share this year than we have in previous years. Uh, we can't invent farmers. And so we are not looking just to put money out there willy-nilly. We want to make effective conservation programs. If there were opportunities, and I'm not a big good proponent of carryover, but to say you got to spend it or lose it by a certain day, uh, I'm, our district is not ever going to succumb to that. But there may be districts who say, well, let's just put something out there so we don't have to give money back to DCR. But thank you for what you've done for us. Um, do help keep Gooch in the world through your efforts and support for the conservation districts. And uh, that's less than three minutes. I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Um, Mr. Mulligan, any announcements you want to make about moving people or anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah, I'd like to say welcome home to the voters that are currently, I hope, when I left the office, I left uh, Kendall with pulling the voters in, and uh, hopefully that's being done as we speak. Letters will start going out tomorrow. But I would also like to add, just to keep on everybody's radar, the uh, no excuse absentee, what's being called early voting, that's going to start in 2020. Okay. Um, that's just something that I think should be on everybody's radar. That will be a, a big cost to localities. And um, as of now, there's no funding for that. And so I just wanted to keep that under everybody's hands. When it starts in 2020? What's that? Did you say it starts in 2020? Yeah, it starts uh, November 2020 for the presidential. That's okay. going to be the first time it's it's implemented. So, um, just, yeah, thought I'd keep that under everybody's radar. Thanks. See a hand in the back of this floor. I've asked this question several times, and I've not gotten an answer. And as you know, I'm a pretty my question is, how do we get a post office in Senate? Um, see, they keep on telling me that it can't happen. I don't buy that. Um, they say it's part of the federal government. It's, 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 that's, that's part of the federal government. Please tell me, we've got all these people moving into Senateville. Everybody's got a different post office. Nobody really lives in Centerville, but yet we're, we're supposed to be a major village. We need a post office so that we can have an identity again. So, uh, our identity to begin with. So please, let's work together to give us an identity as Centerville with a post office. I don't buy it that we can't have a post office. Other, other counties have post offices every other block. You know, but we don't have one, please. Centerville needs a post office. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And um, Ms. Mask is here, and she can maybe take that out to the uh, postal service. It's, a, uh, it's really a, a need out here, and uh, they've been helping me with some mailbox issues along uh, my district where people still have to cross the road to get their mail. And the roads are getting more dangerous because it's more traffic. Um, so anyway, we appreciate any help on that on that front. Remember, we can talk about it more. Okay. All right. If nothing else, um, we're not the board. You guys, I guess you can adjourn your meeting. Yes, we'll, we'll adjourn. Okay. So the board is adjourned. Done. We're only taking a break. Okay. We'll be back in here.